and welcome to the Big Bang. On today's programme... We turn chocolate into a delicious fossilised pterodactyl. We show you how to take a real photograph of a ghost. Spooky. And we build helicopters powered by balloons. But first, a trick. Gareth, it is possible to get this ring off the loop of string without taking the string off my fingers. Oh, but can it you now? do it? Can I do it? Um, I think it's a loop thing, mm -hmm. right? Take that piece mm, of string, yeah. right? make a loop, mm -hmm. pass it through the ring, mm -hmm. pull the loop, yeah, yeah, and... Yeah. No! no. <laughs> that didn't work. How'd you do it? Come on, take it off my fingers, I'll okay. show you. Yeah. Right, it is a loop thing. You do two loops. The first loop there, second loop there, and open your hand. How did that come off there? Do that again. Come on, I'll show you again. This time, I'm going to show you how to do it, though, because it is a bit of a cheat. Hang on, I'm all tangled. The first loop takes the string off the finger yeah. so the ring can come off. And the second loop puts the string back on again. Oh, crafty. <laughs> Look at that. Superb. All right, here's something that will scramble your brain, right? Egbert, the death-defying egg. I can drop Egbert from about here to the ground and he won't break. And that's because he's hard-boiled. <laughs> he might be hard, Violet, but actually, he's a raw egg. See, Egbert survived the drop before the end of the programme. Hoop! And that wasn't it. Halloon. Half helicopter, half balloon. Yay! Hey! Now, I reckon it should be called a ballycopter because it's half balloon, half helicopter. I tell you what, if we make you another one, will you admit it's Halloon? Go all right, then. You'll need a plastic file, some drinking straws and two balloons. Cut the bendy bit off a straw, cut a slit in the end and slot that into the end of another straw. Take them together. Then bend one end up and the other end sideways. Now staple the short end to make it narrower. Stick on a blade shape cut from your plastic file. Make four of these and tape them together in a cross shape. Trim off the ends of the straws, then you'll need to block up the holes between the straws with glue. Finally, you need to cut the neck off one balloon and glue it round the bottom as a grip for the other balloon. When you've glued that, your halloon is finished and ready to fly, and all you need is a balloon to power it. What happens is the air rushes out of the balloon, goes down the straw and comes out of the tips at real high speed. Now that makes the blades spin and because the blades are set at an angle, they create lift and that's why your halloon flies. Aha! I see you're calling it a halloon now. I mean bellycopter. I guess what? What's better than one halloon? Uh, four halloons? Correct. Here you go. <laughs> That's the one I made you. Right. Are you ready? Halloon frenzy. Three, two, one. Go! Yay! <laughs> Meet Florence Nightingale. You might recognise the name. She's, of course, the world-famous lady with the lamp. Don't go on about the lamp. I might be caring and sharing, but there's a lot more to me than a flipping lamp, you know. Today's strange but true story is all about the real reason why Florence was so fantastic and how she saved the lives of thousands of soldiers. Florence was keen to learn about the world, much to her mother's horror. I don't want to arrange flowers, Mother. I want to study mathematics instead. No, no, then, Flo. What's all this your mother tells me about you wanting to study numbers? I want to do something useful with my life, Father. <laughs> I don't start all that, Flo. You know, it'll only upset your mother. I want to work in an hospital. Oh! <laughs> oh. You see, the trouble was, every time somebody said the word hospital in the Nightingale household, Florence's mother passed out for some reason. Oh, Flo. Well, far be it from me to encourage you in your unladylike ways, young lady, but look, there's an article here that says that they're looking for young women to look after injured soldiers in the Crimean War. That's it. That's the job for me. Goodbye, Father. Tell Mother I'm leaving. But, 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 Florence, don't forget your lamp. Oh, stop going on about the lamp. Oh, but you'll need it in the hospital. Oh, oh, mother. 
When she arrived, she couldn't believe what she saw. There were thousands of dying soldiers, and it wasn't hard to see why. No clean water, no soap, dirty bedding, no fresh air, no proper food. This place is disgusting. It's no wonder these soldiers are dying here. It's not their wounds they're dying of. It's the diseases they're picking up in this hospital. So Florence ordered scrubbing brushes and bottles of disinfectant. With cleaner hospitals, there were fewer germs. And soon, the soldiers stopped dying of disease. Florence sat down and wrote letters to loads of generals and politicians, explaining how they could save thousands of soldiers' lives. While she waited for the replies, she returned to the real reason she was at the hospital, caring for the sick. No soldier shall die alone. Every night, Florence would walk along the wards with her lamp. She personally sat with 2,000 men as they died. Unfortunately, all the generals and politicians told Florence not to worry her pretty little head. This is daft. Why are men so stupid? How can I convince them? That's where her maths came in useful. Florence started making lists. How many soldiers were admitted to the hospital? How much space was between their beds? How many drains there were? She collected as many statistics as she possibly could. Once Florence had collected all the statistics, she drew graphs to show her results. My graphs prove that seven out of every eight soldiers who come to this hospital die of diseases that could have been prevented. So it was Florence's love of mathematics and her desire to be useful in the world which changed the way hospitals worked. Now hospitals are cleaner, more organised places which actually do save people's lives. All thanks to the lady with the lamp. Will you stop going on about the lamp? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Chocolate fossils. Yeah, OK, I know it's a bit mad, but we love chocolates and fossils are cool. Besides, you can make them a few million years more quickly than the real ones. Now, real fossils are made when the bones of a dead animal are trapped under layers and layers and layers and layers of very fine dust. The thing is, very fine dust tastes horrible. So we're making our fossils with chocolate. Now, you will need quite a lot of chocolate. Two huge bars of cooking chocolate, in fact, about 600 grams. And you'll need to melt your chocolate. Now, the easiest way to melt chocolate is to put it in a pan on a hob. Cookers can be very dangerous, so it's best to get an adult to help you with this bit. Before you can make a fossil like this, you need a template, a pattern to give it the correct shape. Matchsticks or bits of card will do. When you're happy with your fossil design, cover it with strips of sticky tape. So, the template's easier to peel off when the chocolate's set. And when you've finished, you're ready to fossilise. There you go. Thank you. When your chocolate's melted, take it off the heat and pour it into a baking tray. To get the chocolate nice and even, tip the tray around. Let it cool until it's beginning to set. Then bend back a corner of your template to make it easier to peel off. Now, don't press down, but just make sure that every part of your template is actually touching the chocolate. Then, leave it for several million years, or until the chocolate's gone hard, whichever comes first. Now, real fossils are visible, because the rock from the bones wears down differently from the surrounding rock. But our fossil is going to be visible, hopefully, because the design leaves an imprint in the chocolate. Careful, the last bit. How's it going? Yay, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, that's not bad, but we need to pick out the detail with some icing sugar. Just carefully dust a bit of icing sugar in there over the teeth. Makes you feel like a real archaeologist, this, because they're always dusting old rocks, aren't they? And don't worry if you go over the edges, because if you do that, you can always wipe it off with a damp cloth. Now, when you've perfected your technique, you can make an entire museum of fossils. But there is a difference between our fossils and the fossils that you find in a museum. Ours taste an awful lot better. Oh, that's not my triceratops, is it?
Lovely. Today's big question. Can you believe your own eyes? Run for the hills, they're coming! Who? Aliens! Aliens? The aliens have landed. How do you know? Look, I've got the evidence. Wow! It's really the work of an advanced alien intelligence. Just look at the design of their spacecraft. Yes, you can see that the design of their spacecraft is clearly inspired by the shape of a pizza box. Rumbled. I think these aliens might just be called Violet and they come from the planet Berlin. To make your own fake UFO photos, you don't need flashy computer software. I just made an alien ship out of pizza boxes and threw it in the air. Get close to the ground and aim high and get as much of the sky in the shot as you can. If the sun's out, you'll get a nice moody silhouette. But of course, never look at the sun. Now, out of an entire roll of film, you might only get one or two good pictures, but that's all you need to convince your friends. Don't worry if the photo's a bit blurred. It makes it look more authentic, as if you took it when running away from the aliens. People have been using camera trickery for ages. In 1917, a couple of girls from a village near Bradford spread a rumour they'd seen fairies. All they'd done was cut out drawings of fairies and stuck them to bushes. Amazingly, everyone believed them and they only revealed their secrets a few years ago. If you want to make really advanced fakes, you should have a go at some ghost photos. You don't need a ghost, but you will need a spooky setting and a willing friend who's prepared to dress up in some old clothes or a sheet. Ghost photos rely on taking two pictures from exactly the same place. So you'll need something to keep the camera steady, like a tripod. Pose your ghost in a paranormal position and take the photo. Then, with an old camera like this, you can take one picture on top of the other. So, get your ghost to dematerialise by um, walking out, then take a second picture. The two pictures merge together, leaving a ghostly image on the film. Ooh. Yeah, I think we've got the idea, Violet. That wasn't me. Ooh. So, can you believe your own eyes? No, not if you're taking fake photographs. Yeah! OK, Egbert Stunt Egg, are you ready for your death-defying trick? Now, Gareth, you say you're going to drop your egg from up here to the ground without it smashing. And it's not that I don't trust you, but I don't. <laughs> I said I'd do it, and I will. But if you look at Egbert, right, he is a raw egg, and he is wearing a safety harness and a rather cool pair of shades, <laughs> because Egbert is going bungee jumping, dude! <laughs> I've got him tied up to a piece of an elastic. I hook the elastic over this hook here, and if I drop Egbert from this height, theory says he should free fall through the air. Kiss your tray and bounce up to about here and do it without cracking. No way. Way, sister. Watch this. Three, two, one, bungee! Wow! Yes! yes! I can't believe it. Look, you can even see where he's dented the tray. <laughs> and he hasn't cracked underneath either. Does it work like a real bungee? It is exactly the same as a real bungee. What I did was experiment with the stretchiness of the elastic. What I did was start off with a really short piece of elastic, then make it longer and longer and longer till he just reaches the ground. Gareth? It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Thank you. Do it again. <laughs> Ready? Three, two, one, egg bungee! Oh! Yay! That now, was a start. Without the tray. Get off, you'll never do it. Three, two, one.